we have um this is on our facebook life process program discussion group and people are still chiming in on the I, all right i title i did a nice youtube eye catchy what do you call it clickbaity title it's almost high ironic and so i wrote it's kind of like the way that people title all their videos i said the uh Addictive personality myth destroyed or something like that or exposed or in capital letters. And so people watched it and people still have, you know, comments that they're trying to trying to give about addictive personalities and different definitions of personalities. We don't need to mess with that. We can leave it alone because what we did was just to reframe the conversation. Great. Did Ozzy, my uncle Ozzy live in have an addictive personality for 25 years? What happened to that goddamn personality? Yeah, where did the per day? exactly? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> then you had to do. You, yeah, do you just get a non-addictive personality after that? Because that's what that was the thing is like you do. You, if if it's worth talking about, if there's a real thing called this and it's worth talking about, it means that there's something sort of sort of preordained there. Um, but we don't think now that that's we're true. We're going to put this. This is going to go into the show, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Got good material sure. here. Sure. Yeah, we'll just put it all in. <laughs> I mean, it's. It's the same thing we're talking about with the, the girl in uh, Tom Hanks' movie. I mean, what is an addictive personality? Well, they're intense. They really care a lot. They may get over-involved. Okay, that can have negative consequences. Like Anna Faris. I mean, somebody puts... I mean, she's reading five newspapers at the same time and watching PBS. Like, the lady's intense. Okay, so why not have a hit TV show and write a couple of books and do a podcast? Um, you know, I, I, it's not as simple as saying, well, you gotta, it's, parents know that. It's like you say, parents will say things. Your mother, my mother said, well, we've got to find a constructive outlet for his energy. That's what parents used to say. Now they say, oh, he's got ADHD. We've got to medicate it out of them. And I see that all the time. You know, my, my ex-wife and I deal with our grandchildren. We have a different outlook from the current generation. You know, if a kid runs around and gets dirty, you know, we say, well, don't run in the street or cut yourself, but whatever. You know what I mean? I would say Elon Musk is pretty intense. Uh, maybe Jeff Bezos is pretty intense, too, and Bill Gates and... You know, people who, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, the people who are running their own businesses because their intensity is just around something that they've Well, you can run through so that meaningful. list of people. Yep. You might, you might be aware that Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard in his first year. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then, well, oh my God, failure. I, I don't know what Elon Musk's schooling is. I, I mean... Um, I don't think um, he went to college either. It's, I mean, there are guys who have a little too much energy and ability to bother. Now, you know, right. my children all graduated college, although sometimes I wonder if that was necessary for what, you know, what my son or even what Anna Peel does. Um, they're really building off basic, block, basic building block um, abilities. Anna Peel is good. Uh, talking to people, making them feel relaxed, coming up with ideas, understanding where they're coming from, and she can do an interview that way. It's it's, it's a set of uh, an unusual set of social skills. By the way, one of Anna Peel's skills is she knows how to drink. It so happens, uh, either it's in the article, I hope I'm not giving away any secrets, or she told me, uh, when Anna says, would you like a drink? Chris Pratt said, are we going to drink? You know, and when you interview somebody and you're an expense account, your job is not to tell them, well, you know, you should only have one drink or whatever. And I, I think this is totally uh, off the record. I think they had five drinks. And Anna knows how to consume alcohol. She's not a giant girl. She's 5'10". She's not a big girl. She knows how to respond to another human being and drink in a social situation in a way where she keeps her task in mind and knows how to behave. That's one of her skills. Would you say she's, I mean, you can go through the, what's a personality and you could talk, let's, big, let's go big five in psychometrics or something like that. 
I mean, Anna, you're talking about as someone who is open mind, open to new experiences. Maybe she's agreeable in the sense that it, or task oriented. You know, if it, if it, uh, you could do the whole thing, you go, it was ocean, open minded. I mean, you could see that an open minded person could also be an impulsive or spontaneous acting kind of a person. Could be addiction, could be something. She's not as impulsive and as her uh, older brother was. She's, she combines, they, in the psychological needs hierarchy, they have three power achievement mm, and mm, uh mm. sociability mm. anna's combines she, she, sometimes when you look at a person you think oh those three personality traits don't work out that differently she's able to control situations she's very achievement oriented she got that from me and her mother and she's agreeable she's affiliate they call that affiliative but and, that's uh her older brother who's you know a big deal in e-commerce he's very he was a guy who was very intense I, I don't know if i've told you this story but uh my wife and i were well matched value wise we walked in and they said you know dana has adhd we'd like to put him on ritalin and without looking at each other you know, mary and i both shook our heads no he said you know I mean, he's not destructive. He is a little hard to sit down. And now I, uh, I've been with my son in Central Park and he's got a big booklet in front of him, which has a lot of symbols in it that normal human beings, it's code, can't understand. And he's like, well, people are, his kids are running around, oh, but every, mayhem. And he's reading this code and understanding it and formulating whatever they have to do with it. So, you know, he was a kid who's very intense. And now that seems to be paying off pretty well for him, you know? Exactly. And that, that's my point is that I won't now I won't go through the, all the big five, but but you see where I was going. You could take right. anyone's anyone's. Are we preferences. answering people's questions here? <clears throat> if I, I can get let me get through this. Um, all right you can take but that's an answer to the question that's an answer to some question no no, no. that's why you said i'll be recording but we just went with it i'm this is there's a thread that continues on this on the social media on our uh, social media and it's just people keep pouring on pouring on giving their two cents so just to throw it's another country just to throw another wrench in no yeah no incredibly intelligent things are being said about it too but just disagreements whatever personality is you don't think about uh you have a kid in the world and you say, well, this person's disposition is whatever. They're a conscientious person. They're an agreeable person. They're whatever it is. You don't say, okay, those are good. Those are good. Ooh, that's the addictive one. No one does it. it no matter who is asking the question or who, no one does that. And so it's not useful. And you can do all the statistics and analysis that you want. What we're saying in the life process program, and I think just practically as people, adults in the world is people are who they are. And, you know, how does that comport with, going through the world and being successful. And another and way well. I put that is a personality doesn't equate to addiction. And I know people, you must know people who say, oh, I'm so intense that if I just have one drink, I go crazy. Or if I have more than one drink, so I only yeah. have one drink. That's one yeah. way to go with that. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you, so, so, you know, I know this about my, and I know a guy who said, oh, I'm so intense. If I started smoking, I'd have a cigarette out of each hand. So I don't smoke. I mean, is it that hard to put together? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that their personality, addictive personality, disappeared. But let me get to the from that thread came this question. Now, um, trigger warning for you: this person uses the word trauma several times, but I think she used uh, the way that I'm reading this. She's using it in the most practical, useful way to use the word trauma. Um, I'm gonna just sum up the things that she's saying. It's a really long one. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry. I'd never had a problem using abusing substances until about three years into dealing with the consequences of cancer treatment at around age 46. My health problems began at 30, so I've been able to deal with them for 16 years, and then I lost my entire colon, and then that was it. The only thing that stopped the flashbacks that I had from that, and I had panic attacks and anxiety besides benzodiazepines, was alcohol. So for me, I think the whole thing was kicked off by like medical just traumas along the way it makes me wonder if there should be different distinct categories for the kind of addiction that's just sort of what she's saying is sort of uh 
the naturally occurring non-medicalized, non, I go to the doctor for this kind of addiction that you and I might talk about, range of possible experience. And then, and then like the uh, iatrogenic sort of traumas that say it's because well, from a medical. The, the, the trauma model that Gabor is based on is called ACE, uh, yeah. Adverse Childhood Events. Getting in a car accident or having cancer when you're 30 isn't an adverse childhood event. Adverse childhood events are when you come from a broken household, when one of your parents is addicted, they're divorced, one's a criminal, you're sexually assaulted as a child. You're t I, one of the problems with misusing the word trauma is, apply, is the use of it to describe those things, which are right. childhood dysfunctions that are horrible and should be avoided and then bad things that happen to adults some of which are unavoidable well, let mean, me get this is the, this is you'll want to hear this part this is the meat of her question so like at the end she said i would like to ask dr peel for suggestions for coping when you know there's a trauma in your life that's going to be ongoing so it's not like I can stop having procedures and tests and surgeries. And when I ask the doctors about it, they just kind of shrug. These days you could forget any sort of pharmaceutical help for either pain or anxiety. So what are you really left with besides self-medication? And so what are what's advice she's saying for you? Well, I, I could hardships? throw that question back to you as well. I mean, damn it. <laughs> I knew a woman who got cancer. Yeah, yeah. This is before marijuana was legal and she was getting radiation therapy. And she was uh, seeing a, sur a surgeon in Stanford. He said, uh, do you smoke marijuana? Because maybe you want to do that. I mean, I, to alleviate the pain, to take your mind off it. That's why, you know, uh, 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 one of the pieces I published in Filter, uh, I think Zach came up with the title. People are drinking during the pandemic and taking drugs. Well, that's what they were invented for. I mean, obviously, the critical issue is what we talk about in the life process program and addiction. Is it making your situation worse? Right, right. I mean, obviously, if, if you've got lung cancer and you're smoking, you know, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. Or if you've got a, some kind of an illness that your habit. But even there, I'm just going rifling through my life. My brother's widow develop breast cancer. Alcohol overall, what they say now is that alcohol is related to some cancers, which is true. It's just that it's higher loading on heart disease and more people die of heart disease. However, my brother's widow developed breast cancer. My, my brother's widow was a Mormon. She was brought up in the Mormon faith. Her family was big Mormons. And she likes wine and she drinks it before she goes to bed. And, you know, she has an oncologist. And I say, what did he say? He said, well, why don't you only have one glass of wine before you go to bed? So you, you might say, well, wait a second. This woman has breast cancer. Alcohol is a risk factor for breast cancer. And I'm thinking this oncologist is just think, looking. And I, I think a ton of doctors do that. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you know, the woman's in her late 70s. I, I guess I could tell her never to drink again. It's part of a lifetime routine that works for her. She's a happy, contented person. Uh, I'm not going to tell her not to drink wine. I'm going to tell her, you know, to be, you know, a little bit careful about it and mindful about it. And that's true of a million things. Um, People use drugs and alcohol for reasons. It's what Bruce Alexander in a certain, uh, an area of work he did uh, uh, at one point in mot about motivation. It's a difference between uh, drug use as adaptive uh, or drug use that's maladaptive. Is, uh, and he calls it the exposure versus the adaptive theory of drugs where people say, oh, you'll get addicted if you use a drug at all. And he's saying, well, people are using drugs often for a reason that plugs in. And the question that, you know, I introduce, it's in our uh, chapter in the meaning of addiction, theories of addiction. At, at what point, if any point, does that use of a drug or alcohol as this woman would be using to make her life more pleasant, possibly to offset the pain of treatment? 
That's okay. That's good. She has to be conscious. And to, uh, hopefully she has an ecologist who's a reasonable human being. He says, well, you know, let's wait this out. Um, I don't think this level of use of, is going to hurt you. And you know why you want to do it. And, you know, God bless you. So there's a distinction to be made between, you know, drug use, even if it's illicit drug use, that's helping you in life, enhancing your life um, versus drug use or any sort of behavior that's actually diminishing, you know, your ability to create good experiences in your life. And so it's not really an addiction if she's saying that she's using I, drugs. I, I cut up the DSM-5 because they have a list of what is bad and, and well, they only use addiction with one crazy thing in the world, gambling. But the underlying dimensions of DSM-5 DSM-5 is a harm uh, reduction document. You have to have a, they don't say, well, don't use heroin or alcohol. They don't say if you've been addicted to heroin or alcohol, don't use it. They say, what problems does it cause? And the two underlying dimensions of DSM-5 are maladaptive behavior, dysfunctional behavior, and distress. If, if anything in the book uh, causes you to function poorly, or if it causes you greater emotional distress, then you're in the book. And if it's not, including taking heroin, like Carl Hart does, A, including having hallucinations. You know, hallucinations are not in and of themselves psychotic. Do they cause you distress and do they cause maladaptive behavior? Uh, do they cause you to function dysfunctionally uh, uh, wor work in the world? And that's, you can't do any better. And if you go and you say, they had to come up with that in DSM-5. Didn't my grandmother tell me that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, it's the same with the relationship. I mean, we could get, we could rate everything by those two dimensions. You could say, is this relationship um, love or addiction? You say, well, is it enhancing your life and improving your behavior? Are you making better friends or is it the kind of relationship where the person says, oh, I don't want you seeing your sister and your mother. And when you go to bed at night, are you happy or are you distressed? So, Elizabeth, you're in the thread. So, you know, if it, this answered your question really well, good. Let us know. But also let us know if there's something more that you're looking for besides the, the framing of it. And, like, is drug use basically okay or should you be stopping or something like that? Um, with the information we have so far, you know, that's a, I think that's a pretty good answer. And we, we love you, Elizabeth. And, you know, sometimes, like, deal you only aces and we're you know we appreciate that you're a human being trying to do the best with you know some jokers you got yeah thanks for the question um this one is about social media i don't hear the two of you talking a lot about social media addictions technology addictions like addictions to Facebook or Twitter, what do you think of the new Netflix movie about this? And do you is social media addiction something that you deal with in the life process program? Eager to hear your thoughts. Actually, that's something at some points you and I have been preoccupied with. Yeah. It's in, it's absolutely, because we're dealing with children, mm -hmm. it's absolutely in um, our book, Out, Outgrowing Addiction. And... <clears throat> In a way, we've gotten off it because to some extent, A, everybody's aware of it now. And um, social media and video and electronic addiction is part, uh, is an addiction in ICD-11. There's I have a video about gaming addiction that I did where I, four kids interviewed me from California. It's just a fun thing. Try and look it up. And... Um, and what I say there, and I know you have exact thoughts about this as well. I've heard, I've heard you express them. You're not going to get through life today not being electronically sophisticated. You, why don't you take it for a second there? You oh. work with kids where their link to performing and integrating in the classroom was their electronic video skills. Well, I remember when Snapchat was just coming out. I don't even know if uh, – do you do you use Snapchat or have you heard of it? I don't use it, but I've heard of it. I only have heard – well, maybe I would have heard of it by now. But at the time, the only reason I knew it was because high school kids were using it. Now I have it on my phone. 
So everyone was afraid because you could send these little videos and then they disappear. So like, what's stopping all of my kids from seeing all this pornography or something like, you know, they're just horrified of this technology. Fair enough to be afraid of it, but then I hate to say, I don't know how to put this any other way, but bluntly, your kid's not doing that with Snapchat. Maybe they are, but they have Pornhub. You know, they have uh, they have all these sites. That, what I'm trying to say is that technology, you might not like it and you might not be worried about it, but the answer is not uh, stomp out every little bit of technology all around. It's it's either going to, you're either going to incorporate it into a life in some way, learn about it, learn how to use it in a basically pro-social, good valued way, or it's just going to engulf you because you're not going to, you're not going to get rid of it. And I think that's what you were saying. And what I talked to those kids about, I said, they said, they, they were asking me, well, can gaming be addictive? And I thought I did a good job turning the question around. I said, well, when would you say a friend was having a problem? Right. I remember that. Yeah. And then they'd say, well, you know, he never leaves. His head. I mean, it ain't brain science. If you're a parent, if your child shuts the curtains and spends all day in his bedroom, that's not good. And um, if he plays games with other kids, that's better. And if he goes outdoors sometimes and actually meets some people, which is a whole other... Of course, now we have the pandemic, which scrambles the whole omelet um, and obviously makes the task more difficult. It, but in a way, it, it says what we said. It used to be that you might say to your kid, um, you know, why don't you go outside and play with some kids? Now, to some extent, perhaps the most sociable and interactive thing you can do is to interact through media, mm. social media. Mm. So there, there's an example of where if you had written all the chisel, all this 10 commandments of uh, raising your child and what's addictive, you've had to erase it. And it's hard to erase chiseled stone, as you might know. Um, they still have the same 10 commandments, you know, and um, uh, you have to make, the best deal you can with the environment you're faced with. Um, and of course, we want to create the best environments that are possible. That's what politics are for. That's why you vote for a president. That's why you try and create a good society. You want, we want to cure the pandemic. We want to encourage kids. There was another article in the New York Times. Damn, they do some bad things. They do some good things. The mother said, I'm becoming a mother I don't want to be because of the pandemic. And she says, I'm a pretty good range-free mother, which we discuss range-free in our growing addiction, which is you let your kids hit the turf and, you know, they come home at a certain time. But now when they go out, she lets them out, which is already, you know, one in 10. She says, did you wear your face mask the whole time you were at the playground you know she's becoming the mother that she didn't want to be she you know she wants them to go out and experience life on their own and she's doing that she lets them go to the playground but you know she nags them about making sure they were what can you say that that's the situation we're facing and she's saying i'm becoming a mother i don't want to be i had a totally different reaction i said you let your kids go out she has four sons you let your kids go out and rollerblade and ride scooters, whatever they do at the playground, That people don't do that anymore. And the fact that you say, let's be really, really safe, and you remind them, maybe you remind them a few times too many. You, obviously, at some point, you're going to have to have confidence in them because, you know, you can't, unless you're going to go out there and ride a scooter too. But she's, she's doing the best with a, a changing and difficult situation. And the best is always not to restrict you, to limit you, to make it impossible to have relationships. The Life Process Program is about allowing people to interact with the world freely and fully, to use their skills to develop a purpose in education, a job that they like, to have relationships, intimacy, and community. Obviously, that intimacy and community looks a little bit different today than when you know we first wrote the Life Process Program. I'm gonna, let me ask you like a 2.0 question to this. Um, Tristan Harris starred in that movie about social media. I, I don't remember what it was called, but you know what I'm talking about. The social 
Oh, okay. I'll, I'll oh, the guy it. who developed Facebook, that? that not, Mark no. Zucker, not Mark Zuckerberg. But anyway, it was the guy that was part of this documentary who was saying, well, all these social media giants, their algorithms are meant to basically force you to be addicted. You know, they're tricking you into, you know, behaving in an addictive way. Uh, what are your thoughts on that about about being forced to be addicted? Because I'm not sold that that's that that's a uh, non-resolvable problem. Do you ever perceive that in your experience with social media, Zach, that you're being manipulated because you're a relatively sophisticated social media user? You feel they're you're being corralled at points. Yeah, I guess so. I I just think it's good. Mark, sometimes I laugh at that I'm knowingly clicking on another video. Even though I told myself I wanted only five minutes, but you know now I'm making it ten. I'll la I'm very conscious of it. You know, I'll, I'll laugh it off, saying, "Wow, they really got me." Uh, but but that's not addiction. You know, that's making a choice. And what you're, and what, well, you have a child. Mm -hmm. I have grandchildren. If I watch television with grandchildren, I'm such a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, they have a picture of some good-looking actress. And then they show uh, somebody doing motorcycle tricks. And then they show, they cut, and they show the person doing motorcycle tricks, taking off their helmet to some beautiful woman. So I go to my grandkids, is that woman really doing those motorcycle tricks? And of course, what, my grandkids are like 13 to six. They don't think about that, but I'm making them think about that. They're trying, you know, they're cutting, they don't risk beautiful actresses doing motorcycle tricks. They have people who do motorcycle tricks and they're manipulating the image for you to think, Oh, look, you know, this beautiful woman likes to drive this motorcycle in a risky way for whatever they're selling. And I'm making them mindful. I'm making, well, this is how they make it. People who produce movies or ads do this. Um, you have to be aware of that because your whole life comes through the media. I'll just throw in, I said this last night, I'm, I can barely watch television because they have millions of pictures of people driving cars over dirt roads and gutting yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can't stand it. And, you know, I'm a tough person to watch television with because, you know, I said, look at that. They're crapping up the environment just to sell some giant piece of hunk of machinery. This is disgusting, and people say, "Just watch television, for God's sake." You know what's so, the problem? I'm the same way. That's is that what? Do you like indie movies for that? That I like uh, independent films because it, they're designed. They hope you'll say, "I wonder what's going on there." What do you think that person? What do you think they're doing artistically or something? Anyway, well, um, we, you and I just, um, I don't know how many more questions you have. You and I yeah. have been debating. There's a movie on Hulu right now called. Baby teeth. Yeah. I don't want to, I'll dangerous in danger of giving it all away. It's a girl who's got a terminal illness and she hooks up with a street uh, drug guy. And her father's a psychiatrist who over prescribes medications to her mother who takes too many medications. So, you know, everybody's, and the girl goes out, she's trying to live life for obvious reasons and she maybe drinks and takes drugs in a not constructive way. So everybody's doing something wrong or got a problem. It's just getting back to Elizabeth. Uh, you know, people are were dealt a hand, they're trying to deal with it. And it really makes you think, I feel it's a great harm reduction movie because it's mm -hmm. about, nobody quits their drugs. And I'm just thinking if you're a 12 stepper, at one point, um, the mother says, well, I've given up all those uh, medications. Well, I took a half pill this morning. <laughs> that stuck out to me, too. And uh, you see everybody yeah. in recovery is going, ah, bah, 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 bah. But, you know, yeah. she's cut back, and obviously she's relating more to people. Then they show the psychiatrist who's giving other people medications shooting up. And everybody's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. he's an addict. But, you know, he's got a lot on his mind. His daughter has a terminal illness, and she's dating a drug guy. And that's the only time they show him shooting up. And so um, it's a movie, I feel, that makes you say, well, when is drug use? Nobody in the movie enters recovery. Nobody quits drugs. The street drug guy, who knows what he ends up doing, but he obviously cares about the girl. And he, he actually sort of comes to be loved by the family in a way. It's, a, it's about 
there's more and less drugs and alcohol. There's negative and positive uses of them. All of them use substances at some point in a bad way. But all of them, through their love of each other and through working with one another, come to a more creative and positive resolution of life. And it, a good independent movie makes you say, wait a second. Well, what is bad drug use? What's addiction? I think, it, I think the film can be used as an educational film for harm reduction. As okay. I said, it's called Baby Teeth, and it's right now it's on Hulu. Yeah, it was good. I love the premise of it for those reasons. The last thing I'll say on this, and then there's just one more question, um, is some of the content that's most popular, I think, is pop now, 2020, into 2021, is popular because it does that, like it gets you thinking at that meta level about things. So it, let's, people are thinking more, are they? You feel uh, much more. You wouldn't think about it that way, but let's say uh, that guy, uh, Jesus, Jordan Peterson, wrote the book Psychologist, wrote the book Twelve Rules for Life. He got popular because he recorded all of his um, lectures at the University of Toronto. They're like two, three hours long, and people just binge watched these lectures about psychology. You might like them, you might not like them, but he talks about the world at like the level of. Why am I making decisions? What's good? What's bad? What's Joe Rogan? I'm not saying he's the smartest person or is the best, but three hour long podcasts talking about, you know, comedy, uh, how they make movies, what people are thinking behind the scenes, what their lives are like. People are consuming this at, at large scale, do it yourself videos. So that you take the good with the bad, I think social media, this could definitely lead you down the wrong road, but it can also lead be very, very useful. Well, we're uh, we're so far from uh, uh, their level of uh, performance and audience. I like to think that our little uh, Sundays with stories and question periods are God's gift to addiction. I don't feel I don't feel anybody anywhere discusses addiction with the nuance and complexity and openness and flexibility and revolutionary thinking. And let's take questions from the audience that we do. So, you know, maybe someday they'll find this, you know, buried in the archives of the Internet. And, uh, well, it's what happened with me with love and addiction. You know, people knew about it. And then they said, you know, a couple of things he was saying. Well, geez, in, in 2013, the DSM-5 came up with non, with behavioral addictions. And I wrote Love and Addiction in 1975, talking about behavioral addictions. You know, sometimes it takes a little while to percolate out there and be, to be, come mother's milk. Uh, before the last question, I know I told you about this. I'm sure Go I ahead. did. You know, I was playing, back when you could see human beings, I was playing music at a wedding. And I saw, just by happenstance, saw a guy that I knew from high school. Uh, I was like, well, what are you doing? And I told him a little bit about what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm working with a psychologist, and, and he said, well, what's his name? Stanton Peel. You ever heard of him? Yeah, I actually have. And I thought, okay, well, maybe you have. And he said, no, no, you think I'm lying, but I actually have. And he went to his car. He had a copy of Love and Addiction because he had read it. I think it was like for a sociology class, or it was something he was reading because of his sociology. So, you know, it's out there, and hopefully, hopefully someone finds. It's what, you know, book is a media. This is kind of a media. It's you never know. You get to put stuff out there. And if you're being thoughtful, you never know who it's going to help in the world. I just have to tell why I'm writing my memoir. I'm just finishing it. Archie and Vicky are working on it. Um, after my wife and I got married in California, we split up business wise and she went to Louisville, Kentucky uh, to work at a packaging plant. And she went to the Y every night or many nights a week. And she brought me along when we went there. And the guy behind the counter had opened a hardback copy of Love and Addiction. It was 1975. The paperback wasn't out. And it was one of those things where the guy had underlined too much. He had so many things underlined and highlighted. It was like, it's not worth it. You haven't yeah, done anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my wife's name, she doesn't have the same last name as me. Uh, and she, and, uh, she said... Uh, Oh, my husband wrote that book. And, you know, the name of the book is, it says Stanton Peel, and he knows this woman for months, and her name's not Peel. And he laughs like she's making fun of him, you know what I mean? And then I said, no, I, <laughs> I wrote that book. 
And so, you know, we're out in Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, there are 10 million books. Even then, there were 10 million books. The guy behind the counter is sitting there underlining Love and Addiction. I'm going, huh. <laughs> The book does have a certain amount of power. I remember reading that story. You wrote that in your memoir, right? That's why I read yes. it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So the next question is, I think I've had a gambling addiction. Do you think that gambling addictions can go as sour as addictions like drugs and alcohol? And what's the worst case of a gambling addiction that you've ever seen? So let me all... <clears throat> You know, uh, I, as I mentioned, gambling addiction is the only thing that DSM-5 recognizes as addictive. I've written about gambling addiction all along. I talk about it in Love and Addiction, and I wrote a seminal article for the International Journal of Gambling Addiction. And when I was 19, I was hitchhiking to visit with Archie, who was staying in California with his sister and brother-in-law. And somehow I ended up in Reno or Las Vegas and I met a guy who was going home who had mortgaged his house in order to continue gambling all night. And then when that happens, they give you $20 to get home because they've just taken 50 or $100,000 from you. And the guy, he was beyond despair. He had lost his house. His wife was going to divorce him. You know, he'd given up everything for it. So I knew about gambling addiction from the start. So that's one story. And it can be as severe as any, any addiction can lay you low and kill you. Uh, the second story I have, though, is a funny, different story. I got invited to a gambling addiction conference in Canada, in Halifax. And um, this is this is a Stanton Peel story. <clears throat> um, in, in Canada, they, they, they have gambling is legal, so they force the casinos to donate money to do addiction gambling conferences. So they're big. And they invited me. And one guy's research showed, and gambling in America is illegal unless you're 21, like drinking. I don't know what's the matter with those Canadians. Gambling is legal at 18. And what they found was that most kids don't form gambling addictions, even kids. And I can see that happening. You know, I, I, as a kid, I would go and you'd start throwing quarters at some kind of a game at, a, at some kind of carnival. I've had that experience. But most kids, even at that age, rectify their behavior. They say, oh, for God's sake, I'm not going to go back there again this night. And the keynote lecture had an ad that he had produced about a kid who was going crazy with his gambling addiction and it shows him breaking his TV screen with some kind of a hammer. And so I wasn't the major speaker. I talked at a breakout and in the breakout I said, is that really, is your goal to freak people out as much about gambling addiction as they already are about whatever, heroin or alcohol? Is that your goal? Is that what where we're headed. And I gave that little lecture and all like that. And then later, the hotel was fabulous. You know, they can pay for some good entertainment and gambling conference. And there was a captain's nest. And I noticed that all the speakers were sitting at one table and I wasn't sitting at that table. And I said, huh? And somebody said, oh, the keynote speaker said he was, he kicked you off that table. And so, uh, by the way, when I wrote about this later, I met a guy who said, oh, I was there. I saw that whole thing take place. You know, sometimes I think the stories I tell, did this really happen? Well, on the mm. way out, I saw the guy. And I said, hey, Bill, what's up? And Bill turned on me. And he said, you know, you think it's funny, you know, to get up there and say, uh, uh, look what this crap is all about. Is this really constructive and all? you think you can go and say that about the work I'm doing and then just go back to wherever the hell you're from, it's not going to happen. I said, sorry, sorry, but I only can tell the truth as I see it. You're following a road that's already proved to have failed with drugs and alcohol. Your goal is to create a gambling hysteria the way there was, and is drug and alcohol hysteria, and that's not what I'm about. 
So those are the two sides. Gambling can be addictive. It can destroy lives completely. In general, people, even young people, who you might not have that much confidence in, rectify their behavior because they perceive the negative consequences of it. And however you regard gambling addiction, however you encounter it, it's the same as all addictions. Freaking people out about how they're out of control of it, how it's taking control of your lives, how it's destroying people is not the way you tackle addictions. You tackle addictions by encouraging, supporting, and nurturing people, young people and old people as well, allowing them to realize their own values and strengths so as to be able to build the bulwarks against any kind of addiction, gambling, drugs, pharmaceuticals, what have you, sex and love. Anna Faris, I feel, I don't know, I'm a little disappointed that you're going around on television showing people your giant engagement ring. I, I, I would think at this point in life, you might say, you know, I'm looking for a more, a little bit of a lower key mm. kind of a love relationship, somebody I share values with, who's politically uh, tuned in with me, who likes a lot of information, who likes to... Hike, you know, we we have more in common rather than, oh, my God, finally, the mate of my life. This is the answer. Uh, that's what I, the discussion I'd like to have with her. We're recording this on the same day as we talked about Anna Ferris, but uh, people might, if they haven't watched it, you're, um, it's almost like she's holding up her, her sobriety chip. And she hasn't made the same connection that, you know, people say alcohol is horrible, but I kind of have to do my own thing. She hasn't made that connection with uh, her love relationships. She's still trying to follow She hasn't the... generalized. And she's a brilliant woman who's had a lot of success. I, I hope she'll expand in that direction. I'll tell one last thing. When it comes to gambling, um, you know about this client. And if you don't remember, I'll, I'll forward you again. So I can't say too much, but it's somebody that I worked with. And uh, we began working together, and he used to talk about his gambling. And he, this is a person, he's mil millions in the hole. Um, and, you know, legal repercussions for it. And he was first trying to say, well, my, you know, my traumas made me do it. And, like, my, you know, my gambling took me over. And so I didn't say, no, your traumas didn't, no, the gambling didn't. But I did ask him some pointed questions. And what he, what he decided was that, he turned to gambling for an experience that he felt was an absolute lifeline. I can't, there's no shot at me getting it some other way. I can kind of get it. I can piece it together through gambling, the trips, the entertainment, the, the women that I meet, the people who think I'm important, the rush that it gives me, uh, put it all together and there's some good and some bad, but it's at least better than my inability to create it somewhere else. And I thought that that was, you know, that was just, he came to the conclusion that was just, he could have written a book for us, you know, at that point. So that just goes to show it's not like you've always said and you're saying now, it's not the thing. You know, Carl Hart says, drugs aren't the problem, opioids aren't the problem. And we can kind of say gambling's not the problem. But of course, insofar as someone has a problem with it, it can, it can uh, yield just as destructive consequences as anything else. Well, what I liked about your description and what you allowed him or helped him to come to see is gambling came to be one big package for all of the needs that he wasn't fulfilling and it became the object of his desire, right. his addictive object, it, for a reason. But the reason isn't gambling I, maybe the reason has something to do with trauma but that's not what his life currently is about and you helped him to dis we've been talking about mindfulness we've been talking about making people aware of the function that an activity serves in their life to be able to deconstruct that and when once you can objectify it once you can come to grips with it you can deal with it you can curtail it you can find alternatives and that's the gift of you and this person in coaching and which I've seen you do in other arenas. So those are our, the big questions today. There are a couple other questions, but I'm not actually accepting people figure this out. I'm not accepting questions that are more statements than questions, you know, just because they have a question mark in them. Uh, so the, the people are valued just as much, but I'm trying to take questions in earnest. So 
Those are a good. We have to that. limit our time somewhat at some yeah. point. We do have <laughs> one or two other little things to do. That's right. All right, Zach. Uh, adieu again. Uh, there's nobody I'd rather spend time with more and discuss and dealing with things more than the things that we talked about tonight and in other sessions. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. And folks tuning in, ask questions if you want to. Info at lifeprocessprogram.com on social media, or just go to the website and you can find anything that you need out about our program or how to get in touch with us. It's lifeprocessprogram.com. And all of that is in the show notes. Have a great night, Stanton.